Now, he was a heroin, heavy-duty heroin addict. He woke up the next morning detoxed, hardly any residuals and no cravings. What it does is give you a head, a head start on your recovery. You go back into your childhood to make it simple as, let's say, as an adult, and you review all of your past traumas, and you have what is known as a cathartic experience. And what that means is that you have resolution. And when you come out, you're not only detox, but you are ready for treatment. Welcome, John, to the Inside Addiction podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. So I wonder if you could start off just by telling me a bit about how you came in to have addiction in your life and what that was like in, in your kind of early childhood and teen years. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'm a recovering addict. I'm, I'm coming up on 39 years of recovery December 4th. Um, I've been doing addiction treatment for, oh, about about 37 years. Uh, I'm also one of the leading experts on um, the psychedelic treatment. I work with a Dr. Deborah Mash. We used to do what we were doing, not that we used to, we still do actually, uh, Ibogaine. And Ibogaine is a uh, bush from West Africa. We had a weedy tribe and they use that for a rite of passage. And what had happened was a gentleman named Howard Lutzoff, uh, what he did, he wanted to get a new high, so he went to Gibran, and he did Ibogaine. Now, he was a heavy-duty heroin addict. He woke up the next morning detoxed, hardly any residuals and no cravings. So he decided, wow, I can make money with this, and he opened up a place in Panama. And that's how Dr. Mash got involved. She's one of the leading experts pioneer in Ibogaine medicine. So what um, what happened was, after a while, they didn't get along, I guess, and she opened in St. Kitts, because see, Ibogaine is a schedule one drug, which is ridiculous, because this is not the kind of drug that you want to keep doing, okay? Because if you like to spend time in hell, then, then you can keep doing it, because what happens with Ibogaine you go back into your childhood to make it simple as, let's say, as an adult, and you review all of your past traumas, and you have what is known as a cathartic experience. And what that means is that you have resolution. And when you come out, you're not only detox, but you are ready for treatment. So uh, some of the problems with Ibogaine is that People that come out of the, the Ibogaine journey, they think they're cured, and they're not. It's not a magic bullet. What it does is give you a head, a head start on your recovery. So the molecule, which turns into a Nora Ibogaine, which Dr. Mash coined that phrase, lasts for about 90 to 120 days, and uh, where you feel like you have no cravings and you want to get well, and things like that, okay? So you have that window of time to go to treatment, to get therapy, and to work on your life skills, and to become a better human being. Because us addicts, we become inhuman humans. Yeah, and what happens if you don't get treatment in that time, you think, I'm fixed, I'm cured, uh, what happens after the 90 to 120 days? Well, what happens is some people relapse, okay? Uh, some people don't. You know, everybody's different. And uh, as far as the 90 and 120 days goes, it depends if you're a fast metabolizer, slow metabolizer, how your liver functions and things of that nature. So uh, I began, the problem is, is that a lot of do-gooders, and I mean, they really do want to help people, um, give I began to people without really looking at their medicals, without looking at what's on board, uh, they don't do a toxicology test because some of the drugs that people take can interfere with Ibogaine and you can also die because your blood pressure goes all the way down and you're gone. What we did was they used to come to my treatment center, it was G&G &G Holistic Addiction Treatment Program in North Miami Beach. It was a 62 bed uh, residential program. We had 
PHP, Poshville Hospital Program, intensive outpatient, outpatient, and aftercare. And um, they would come. And what we would do is we would put a heart monitor on them for 24 hours to make sure their heart's functioning properly because an EKG is only a snapshot of what's going on with your heart. And then we would do a full blood panel on them to see how their liver's functioning and their kidneys are functioning. Then what we would do is we do a toxicology test to see what's on board and a, psych and a, and a psychiatric evaluation to make sure that they don't have a disassociative disorder and not schizophrenic or some of those are rule outs for psychedelics. And then we would bring them to the island of St. Kitts. We would repeat some of the screening processes. We we'll give them an EKG. We will check on... Uh, on a bunch of things. Uh, we would check on to see if they have any drugs on board and things like that. Then my job was to do what is called integration with them, counseling, which means that when they come in, they must, you want to have an intent when you're doing psychedelics. Okay, you have to have a certain mindset to get to your underlying issues that drive your addiction. So we set all that up with them. And then we put them in a hospital bed. We put an IV in their arm in case there's any kind of an event so we can get them out. Then we put a heart monitor on them. And then we put eye shades and we put music also to keep them in a containment field. Then we would give them a test dose to see how they tolerate, wait 45 minutes to see if they tolerate the drug. And then we would give them a full dose. And usually... People would go under for about anyways from 8, 10, 12 hours, depending on what, how they metabolize the drug. And then when they come out, my job was to help them to what they saw in their journey. Because what, they, what, what happens is, they, you, to put it simply, you go back into your childhood as an adult and you have that resolution, that cathartic experience. Okay? And you start to understand some of the emotions that are driving your depression, your anxiety, and you know that, and then your addiction. So that was my job to do. And I started doing this in 1996, you know? So now there's other psychedelics that are coming out. Uh, you got ketamine. I was owning a, a ketamine clinic and I was against it because ketamine is like special K, uh, they called it, and it was a club drug. And I says, oh, you know, I was lecturing in Taiwan, and there was four at the neuroscience conference, and four of the scientists uh, had lectures about ketamine, and it didn't sound good to me. They have an epidemic in Taiwan, or Taipei, okay, on ketamine. So I said, I'm not going near this. This was about six or seven years ago. And then I was watching, I, and I'm a researcher, so I was watching what was going on with the latest science and how they started to see on the medical supervision, how we could benefit people and how we can grow new connections in the brain. But you have to nurture those connections and it's not a magic bullet. So done under the right uh, circumstances and with medical supervision, and you have to have therapy with it. You have to do integration with it pre and post. Uh, very important. So this way you, you know, it's like the new connection is like a seed that you put in the ground to make sure the soil is fertile, making sure it gets enough water, enough sunlight so it can grow. So if you don't do that, then what happens is, is this, you go back to doing what you've always done. So it's really then psilocybin is another one which is an incredible uh, substance that also helps with depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And that's a longer journey. The ketamine journey is about 45 minutes. And but figure about two hours, we'd leave them where they are so they can process the information and, you know, things of that nature. And um, psilocybin is more like a six, maybe eight hour journey. And also helps, and I was with uh, Dr. Paul Stamus. He's the pioneer in uh, psilocybin. It's a very, very interesting uh, substance. 
So that also works really good. Now you got um, MDMA, which was another, which was ecstasy, that a lot of you see used as a club drug. But now they're doing experiments with that for PTSD, depression, and anxiety. And it's going to, in January, this, this January, they're um, legalizing it for therapy. And they got the CPT codes already. That's for insurance. Um, and it should be um, in January. They're going to legalize it. And the insurance companies will start possibly paying for it. So the psychedelic world is coming because SSRIs, like Wellbutrin and uh, uh, Prozac and Effexor and all of these SSRIs really don't work very well. And it's really an educated guess when psychiatrists give it to you. And a lot of our uh, soldiers are committing suicide with some of these drugs. So we need something different. You know, people don't like change. And, you know, it's interesting. Therapists are supposed to be people that help people to change, but unfortunately they don't change. So you only can take somebody as far as you are, which is the bottom line. Now, you're a counselor now, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to give you some insight about things that you didn't learn in school. Uh, this is what I teach the medical community. I lecture all over the world. I'm in 80 medical and scientific peer review journals. I work with uh, neuroscientists, geneticists, um, psychiatrists from about 12 universities. And we're looking at addiction and mental health because they go hand in hand. It used to be many, many years ago that you went to a substance abuse treatment center and then you would come out and go to a mental health treatment center, which was ridiculous. Um, so I work with a Dr. Ken Blum. Uh, Dr. Blum is the geneticist who found the main gene for addiction, which is called the DRD2 ALE1 variant gene. But just because you have that gene doesn't mean you're going to become an addict because of such a thing as called epigenetics. Now, epigenetics means that the social environment can change the gene expression. So, um, going back into it, now, what causes depression and anxiety? Well, we can look at the psychological piece, which is trauma, abuse, uh, things like that. But we also have to look at the medical part, which this is the part that I lecture about that we're not looking at. So I'll give you an example. If you have a low thyroid, Luke, do you think talking to that thyroid is going to fix it? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you have a low thyroid, you're going to have depression and anxiety, right? And if you have low testosterone, do you think talking to your body is going to fix that? No. No. Right? All these things that I'm mentioning causes depression and anxiety. All right. And I always tell people, please don't believe a word I tell you. Go look it up for yourself. All right. So now you got what is known as leaky gut syndrome, H. pylori infection. These are all gut issues that cause depression and anxiety. We did a research project at my treatment center, and we found 85% of the people that went through there, the, the males, all right, had low testosterone. So you're going to have depression and anxiety because of that. Now there's also hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, uh, most alcoholics have that when they quit alcohol because alcohol is basically has sugar. So you take it away and then they get low blood sugar. Um, not necessarily, but they can. Let's put it that way. So then you have closed head injuries. And how many addicts get stoned, they fall, they hit their head. And uh, you think anybody will argue with me that drugs and alcohol damage the brain? No. Nope. So let's talk to the brain and fix the damage. I don't think that's going to work very well. Okay? So what we have to do is we have to learn how to take care of that damage. And there's a thing called HBOT, which is hyperbaric medicine. That's oxygen under pressure that was used for the bends. That's when divers went down real low in the ocean. And um, they have nitric oxide in their blood. Um, and then they have to sit in the chamber to rebalance all of that, or they can have the beds. Um, 
what they found out also that it does wound healing. And I work with some of the top scientists on the planet, uh, like Dr. Paul Harch. Dr. Harch, and you guys can look him up. Uh, he wrote the book, The Oxygen Revolution. Uh, he's out of the university. He's a neuroscientist that works in um, Louisiana. And what he showed was he went to the Senate with Dr. Williamson, another friend of mine, and they went to the Senate and they got them to approve wound healing for diabetics. Okay, because diabetics get wounds and they don't heal, they get gangrene, then they have to cut their, their legs off, their arms off. So that showed the efficacy of hyperbarics, but also for brain injuries. And look, if you can heal a cut, it can heal your brain. So we're not doing any of this stuff, by the way. Have you heard any treatment centers doing this? No, that I know of, no. And not any of that I've worked in, no. It's not. It's, you know, treatment centers are supposed to be a medical model, right? Yeah. Where's the medical? Yeah. What's the you, medical? You, you get some medication for detox in the UK, like diazepam or something like that, but you don't get, like, medical interventions, as it were, like what you're talking about with the psychedelics and those kind of other therapeutic modalities, no. Not only that, looking at what's going on that's causing depression and anxiety, that's what drives us addicts to use. Yeah. So what I'm hearing from you, John, is there's two parts, right? There's the trauma and the and the thoughts and all those things that's there, but there's also the actual physiology of your brain and actually what's going on in your chemistry and all that kind of stuff. And it's important to look at both of them, not just one. You see, they call it holistic, and most people don't even know what holistic means. It means a global approach, a comprehensive approach to addiction and mental health. They go hand in hand. And working with Dr. Blum, I'm on his research team, he coined the phrase RDS, reward deficiency syndrome, meaning a lack of serotonin and dopamine. Okay, those are your feel-good drugs that we manufacture naturally. Okay, so you got hyperbarics to help heal the brain. Now the gut, and I've been talking about the gut for over 20 something years, okay? Your microbiome, your microbiota it's called, okay? That's the flora in your gut. When that's out of balance, they call it a second brain. There are more neurons that are in your gut than have in your brain, number one. And you guys can look this stuff up, okay? Number two, okay, what, what happens is, is that when the gut is out of balance, your brain gets out of balance. So the gut produces about 85 to 90% serotonin and dopamine in your gut. Those are your natural feel-good drugs, okay? So what happens is it goes up what is called the, the, the vagus nerve and deposits it into your brain. Now, if you're deficient or your, your gut is not working properly, you don't get enough dopamine and enough serotonin, okay? So what happens is us addicts, we look to boost it. Okay, so which is what's called chasing the buzz. You remember that term, right? Okay, so the bottom line is is that in order to bring homeostasis to the human body and mind, you have to do a few things. Number one, you have to eat properly. Stay away from processed food and sugars. Okay, number two, exercise. People have a heart attack. What did they tell them to do? Go exercise. Your body is not meant to be sedentary. To go sitting around all day. So when you exercise, you get, you're familiar with a run is high, right? Yeah. So when people run or they get exercise, they get like elated. Okay. Because what happens is when you exercise, you deplete stress. All right. And then what you do is you raise dopamine. So this is how exercise works. So you want to I want to have an exercise program besides it's healthier, okay? If you notice most heroin addicts when they quit heroin, they put on a ton of weight. Okay? Why is that? Well, because what they what they're doing is switching seats on a Titanic. Okay? They're going the the food becomes the drug. Okay? So what happens is addicts start medicating themselves with food. Cocaine addicts medicate themselves with sex. They become sex addicts. Alcoholics, okay, what they do is usually, which is very interesting, they use gambling. 
Now, I'm not saying for everybody, but those are some of the precursors for different addictions. I never met a person that only had one addiction. We, yeah. we, we hop from one addiction to another addiction. It's like a guy drinking a vodka and he says, well, I'm not going to drink vodka anymore. I'll just drink beer. Yeah. So now he keeps going to the bathroom and it has the same results anyway. Yeah. yeah. And can, can, can we get rid of addiction? Can we complete, completely be addiction free? Is that possible um, in your mind? Well, I'll put it to you this way. What happens is being an addictive personality disorder, you need to go to therapy. You need to work on the behaviors that you developed during your childhood, during your addiction and things like that, to start to understand how you function and what goes on, you know, the way you make choices and things like that. Uh, and you have to find a good therapist. And since, and what is a good therapist? Okay, I suggest very strongly people learn EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. It was founded by a Dr. Shapiro about, I don't know, about 25, I've been doing it for about 23 years. It was founded about 25 years ago. Matter of fact, I even redeveloped it because I also, I have a master's in uh, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Uh, I'm also a hypnotherapist. I do holotropic breathing. Um, so these things I put together with EMDR. Now, most people say, well, I don't understand. What is EMDR? Well, here's how it works. Dr. Shapiro, is her father, this is a story I got. I don't know how true it is, but this is a story I got. Her father had died, and she was rather depressed, as you can imagine. And she was walking in a field of tall grass. Um, and all of a sudden, her depression lifted. And now, being a neuroscientist and being a researcher, she couldn't understand how that could be possible. And she backtracked everything she did. And the only thing she can remember was there, there was wheat that it was blowing back and forth, and she was getting fixated on how that was moving. So she checked, uh, there was a team out of Berkeley that was doing REM studies, rapid eye movement studies. And what she came up with, how the eyes encode trauma on the brain. So she did this technique where they moved the hands in front of the eyes in different cadence, okay? And to put it simply, it, 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 it raises like electrical storm in the brain. Okay, so you have to understand PTSD is a closed unit. Okay, it keeps going on and over and deeper and deeper and, and it forms neural pathways. So what you want to do is break that so it spreads out. Okay, in the brain and diminishes the effect. So what EMDR does, it puts kind of like a glass in between the emotional state and the trauma. And you look at it from an intellectual point of view, so you can extrapolate out what you need to do to feel better. Otherwise, if your emotions get involved, you go into that deep, dark depression, and it's hard to get out of. Right? So that's what EMDR does. I do that with the military. I'm a chaplain for the police department also, and I um, work with officers that have been in shootings, women that have been molested, raped. Um, guys coming back from Iraq, Afghanistan. So I, I do all that kind of work also. So there are a lot of good technologies out there that we're still teaching uh, uh, therapy the same way we did for years. Uh, oh, we got cognitive behavioral therapy. We got all these wonderful therapies. But the problem is, is that we're not going deeper into what's really going on with the human being. And uh, we get stuck in a modality and that's what we see and we're not looking outside the box. Yeah. So what you want to do is get out of that little box and get into a bigger box. I'll put it to you that yeah. way. Yeah, and rather just looking at therapy, like you say, look at exercise, diet, therapy, ideally EMDR, and also consider the psychedelic treatment in order to get a boost on all of that to start off the journey. See, there were a lot, and, and here's the problem is that the 28-day model for treatment is a 70-year-old model. And we know how much things changed in 70 years. 
Well, they didn't change for the addiction field, right? So there were two kids that were going to school. I think one was a psych, uh, was studying psychology and the other one was studying something else. I don't remember. And they came up with this 28-day model. They they gave it to, um, they brought it to, I think it was to Hazleton. And they talked to the insurance companies and then it became 28 days, which is kind of ridiculous when you look at it. So look at what really goes on. Okay. You, you, you go to detox. If you're lucky, you're there seven days. It takes anywhere from seven to nine days to get rid of a severe opiate detox. And what do they do? They give you another opioid to get rid of the opiate, which, which is kind of comical. All right. People get stuck on Suboxone and, and Methadone. And now they just switch seats on the Titanic again. Yeah, And the bottom line is we're not getting to the root cause of what's driving these addictions. What we're doing is we're putting band-aids on it. And there's a lot of people that do Suboxone, they're doing other drugs anyway. You know, same with methadone. If you go to a, 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 if you go around the neighborhood in the methadone clinic, you'll see there's everybody selling uh, their take-homes, they're, they're doing other drugs. I mean, it's almost like comical. There's no magic bullet for this. The magic bullet is hard work, period. You know, everybody, you know, people go to meetings and I don't tell people, I don't say, hey, you need to do this, you have to do that. No, okay. I always ask people, how well do you want to be? Yeah. I was going to ask you, John, what what do you think about the 12 steps? You mentioned meetings. What do you think about AA and the 12 steps? That seems very different from what you're talking about. Yeah, well, here's the deal, all right? But the problem is people are not explaining to people what the 12 steps are about. Okay. I don't care if you go to church and get well. I don't care if you stand on your head in the closet and get well. Okay. It doesn't matter to me. Whatever works for you, whatever floats your boat. But if you start to understand what these 12 steps are about, look, if you're, let's say you're not gay. All right. You're not going to hang out in a gay bar because that's not your people. There's nothing wrong with being gay, but I'm just saying you're not going to go into that bar, okay? If you don't drive a motorcycle, you're not going into a motorcycle bar. Well, where all the motorcycle people go? <clears throat> so if you, when you go into the 12-step, what you do is you're going around people that have the same illness that you have, And they're all working on themselves. So, you know, people say, well, I I know I'm one of those people. I said, look, I don't want to join a new religion, okay? Because it's spiritual based, not a religious base. But people get confused about that. Uh, And people say, yeah, but there's a lot of sick people in that room. Yeah, you're right. It's like going to a hospital and say, there's a lot of sick people in that hospital. (laughs) I mean, it's almost comical when you think about it. Um, some of the people just go there and they're on their phones and doing stupid shit, okay? And there are other people there that really want to get the message. And the message is what the 12 steps are really about. It's an inward journey of how you became what you became. And what it's about is learning about you so you can learn about other people also. Because basically, we're all the same. We want to be loved. We want to be appreciated. We want to be uh, understood. Uh, you know, we want to feel connection with other human beings, all this stuff. And, and this is the basic things of human beings. Um, when, I, when I started off in recovery, uh, I'll give you a little background of me so people can understand. Uh, my family was like a mafia family. My uncle was a hitman. My grandfather was a Shylock. Those are people that uh, lend you money and you're going to pay one way or the other with high interest. And uh, my father was a heroin dealer. I got molested when I was eight and a half. My father went to jail when I was eight. Uh, Then I got molested again when I was nine. And uh, that carried me with all kinds of problems in my head. Because, and I work with people that have been molested, and there was a moment in time, even though it was a split second, that it felt good, even though the shame and the guilt and there's something wrong with me came into play. 
and I blame myself. Why, why it's my fault or why didn't I feel good or, you know, what's going on with me. So I had to work through all that. Then when uh, <clears throat> I was in gangs when I was a kid and, uh, and then I went to karate and I got out of the gangs. And what happened was, is uh, when I was 20, my uncle, the hitman, threw my wedding. And it was an interesting wedding. And on one side where the, the bride family is, there was doctors and lawyers. and She was Jewish and I'm Italian. And the family wanted her to marry a Jewish man. But they met my family and they really liked them, which was really comical. But they were a good family. It was just that we did nefarious things. So what wind up happening was on the other side, the groom side, my side, were racketeer guys with guns and, you know, all kinds of guys like that. So what happened was the caterer insulted my uncle in front of the family. So he killed him the next morning. So we had to leave town, my bride and I, because the, uh, the police were coming to my grandmother's house. And um, it's a, I, I wrote this book. It's called um, The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up. And it's, it's my life story of what I've been through. I always said I'll never grow up to be like my family. And I wind up um, selling drugs. I wind up doing drugs. Uh, I wind up doing collection work for the smugglers. Uh, I used to teach one of the cartels in Colombia, their bodyguards, karate, because I'm a martial artist. Um, and I did a lot of the same nefarious things that my family did. And the only reason I went to treatment is because my family did an intervention on me. All right. And I was wondering who's doing an intervention on them. They're selling drugs. They're doing all this stuff. And they want me to go to treatment. So I said, hey, let's go as a family. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so um, I went to treatment and I was totally resistant. I never unpacked my luggage. Uh, I was always going to the elevator to leave, uh, but they kept me there. And uh, they used to bring me into the office and talk to me, John, stick around. And I stayed around. And I, I remember I was in group and uh, they said, you know, you got to share some of your stuff. And I said, look, I wouldn't share anything with you. I wouldn't even get high with you people, let alone tell you who I am and what I'm about. So, well, after about two weeks, I started to clear up. And it was really interesting what happened. It was Christmas time. I, got, I went in December 4th. And so around Christmas Eve, in three weeks, I wanted to go home for Christmas Eve with the children. I didn't want, uh, you know, the kids to see me in the hospital and all of this stuff. And I, I was lying. The only reason I went was uh, my friends would give me a Christmas card with Coke in it. So that's why I really wanted to go home. It wasn't because I wanted to see the kids, okay? I mean, I wanted to see them too, but really it was mostly for the coke. Uh, anyway, uh, they told me I couldn't go. And I don't know about you, but I used to get rageful, not just angry. And it took me either hours or days to get rid of. So I, I punched the door in my room. I went in and I was cursing and, you know, angry and, Stuff like that. And then I remember my therapist told me, he goes, hey, John, you ever you ever pray to God or whatever God is to you on your knees? I said, look, man, I got calluses on my knees. I'm a recovering Catholic, you know? So um, he said, no, for humility. I said, well, give me a break. What do you mean God doesn't listen to me? How about if I'm in a closet? You think he hears me? So, but it ignored at me. And I was in a lot of pain because I started to realize how I hurt it myself, my family, and everybody else, and I was looking to medicate. So what happened was I went to get down on my knees, and this may sound like kind of funny to you people, but I couldn't put my knee down. And I said, what the hell is this? And, and it was like something was going on. I don't know. So I finally pushed my knee down. I pushed my other knee down. I said, look, whatever you are, God, energy, I don't know, but just take this away from me, and I'll do whatever you want. Well, strange thing happened. My anger left like it never was there. And I, I just couldn't believe it. So I tried to get it back. Didn't come back. So that was kind of like my spiritual awakening and treatment. And I only went to the ninth grade. Uh, you know, I didn't have an education. 
I, I went from job to job. I took, I took, uh, I taught karate to make some money, you know, here and there. So when I got out of treatment, I went to therapy. I went to aftercare. I, I did everything. They taught me 90 meetings in 90 days. I just kept going to meetings. I didn't like them. Uh, you know, when they talk about God, I said, listen, I, I'm not interested in the God thing. So one of the old timers came up to me and said, how about G-O-D? So look, man, I said, I know how to spell. He said, no, no, no. How about good orderly direction? I said, that I can handle. So that was my God for the first couple of years, actually. And, you know, if, if, you, if you go to things long enough, you start to catch on to what's working for you. So I, I always used to say, listen, I don't know. I, I still don't feel good. I don't even understand what you people are saying. I keep going and I don't feel good. So they said to me, did you use today? I said, no, you're already doing good. So I said, well, okay, if you want to put it that way, okay. So eventually I started to understand what these meetings were. And it was an introspection into John, you know, into what I became and how to change it. Yeah. But you have to do the work, you know, you have to trust. And I didn't, I'm a street kid, so I don't trust anybody. All right. So as time went on, uh, I got clean. Uh, I got divorced. They said, don't make any major decisions for the first year. So I waited about nine months and I said, my wife was still using, I said, I got to get out of here. And um, I did. She got the car, she got the house, she got everything. And I was homeless. And a friend of mine uh, actually gave me a room. He had a hotel that he owned on the beach. And here I am in a room with a little warmer, a little jar that he used to put quarters in when I had quarters, and a bicycle somebody loaned me. And I said, this is recovery. It sucks. Okay. And then, uh, but I was doing better, and I was recognizing a little bit of feeling better, but not totally feeling better. Okay. And I didn't even know what better was, if you want to know the truth. So, and then AIDS came around and uh, I said, oh, great. Now I'm going to catch a disease on top of everything because I don't like to wear what you call a raincoat, contraceptives, right? So uh, I don't want to go too far into the book. So what happened was eventually uh, I, I, I told my friend that owned the hotel that I wanted to open up a treatment center. And I had this doctor that was a famous addiction doctor. But I lied. I never even talked to the doctor. All right. So he said, Well, how much money do you need? I says, uh, 250000 Now, what did I know about what you need for treatment? The only thing I know about treatment is I was in one. All right. So anyway, uh, he said, If you got that doctor, I'll give you the money. I said, Okay. So he I went to doctor, uh, my doctor who treated me, and I says, Hey. Would you like to open up a treatment center? I got $250,000. He said, you know, John, I was just thinking about that before you walked in. But he was a comedian. That's what, you know, he told me. So I says, oh, great. So we became, uh, uh, he, we opened up a treatment center. Uh, my therapist, I brought him in because he's the help, you know, a guy considered he helped me save my life. And he was making $29,000 a year. I gave him $50,000 a year. And he eventually came on, but he didn't like the fact that his uh, client was his boss. So there's a whole thing that happened. They wind up, you know, taking the treatment center out from under me. And the, the doctor was taking money that he wasn't supposed to because he only had three years clean. And he, has a, he was a sex addict. I didn't know, you know, and he was buying hookers and buying apartments for them. We couldn't make payroll. And, and, and my therapist said, Oh, you're the guy to put the money up. He's the one that's stealing. I said, he doesn't have access to the checkbook. What do you mean he was stealing? So anyway. For you, John, story, how did you but, deal with all of that whilst in recovery, uh, all difficult. of that stress and pressure? Yeah, how was it to, to not relapse? Or did you relapse? Like, how was it? No, I didn't. never relapsed. Yeah. How I dealt with it is because I was hyper-focused on becoming a therapist. Okay? So all that didn't happen for almost a year before the shit hit the fan in plain English. Yeah. Okay. Maybe out of my eight, nine months. And so what happened is I went back to school. I got my GED. 
uh, I went to uh, college and I took, I got 300 hours at the Addiction Training Institute, but I needed 6,000 hours to get my certified addiction professional certification of supervision. So now where was I going to go to get supervision? So I swallowed my ego, I swallowed my pride, I swallowed my anger, and I focused on doing that. And eventually I got the 6,000 hours after about, it was like 2,000 hours a year. Okay, so I had to spend three years there. And then eventually what I did was uh, I, I went into this guy's office and I told him I was gonna rearrange his face and no plastic surgeon is gonna put it back together again. Then I would have called my uncle. See, my uncle was in treatment with us because he had a crack cocaine uh, uh, addiction and he was a hitman. So it was funny, one day he was in group and they come running into my office and they go, John, John. I said, why, what did my uncle do? No, he's telling about all the people he killed. I said, I told you what he did for a living. You know, so. But anyway, uh, I got a contract from them. And eventually, three months later, uh, I, I told them, buy me out. They gave me $80,000. They were making millions. I, I got $80,000. Then uh, I opened up another treatment center. My friend uh, turned me on to somebody else. But I didn't have a lawyer on any. I'm a street kid. You mess with me, I punch you in the face. Okay, so I couldn't do that now, you know, and, and there's a whole story about all, all the trials and tribulations I went through and going through all this, this journey. It wasn't an easy road. Um, and then I got beat again from another guy. And then what happened was I um, eventually now I learned everything about the addiction field. I mean, from marketing, from how it ran, being a therapist. I wasn't just a therapist because I was an owner, so I learned everything about the inner workings of how you open up a treatment center, what you do. So I became like an expert on that and how to make JACO accreditation. And uh, JACO is the gold standard for treatment centers. It's a governing body that looks at uh, how you process your, your clients and what you do and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, I uh, was going out with this woman and she says, and oh, before me digress, I became the clinical director of a 55 bed uh, indigent facility. That was an old TC, a therapeutic community where they would put the guy in the middle of the room in the attic and then beat him up and then try to build him back up. And I said, this is ridiculous. I didn't need anybody to beat me up. I beat myself up better than you can. So what are we yeah. doing? You know, what are we doing here? And, uh, so eventually I left there and then this girl I was going out with says, hey, why don't you open up an outpatient clinic? I said, no, I, don't, I only got $300 uh, in my bank because I spent every money I had because I had a spending addiction. Like I said, we have more than one addiction. So my friend owned the building and what I did was uh, I finally went to him. I said, listen, how much does it cost for that little 750 square foot building you have? Uh, so he says to me, how much money do you have? I said, well, I got $300 in the bank. He said, I'll tell you what, open it up in about two or three months and you stop making money, then you can start paying me. So that's what I did. Long story short, I went partners with one of my friends that I, I uh, met in the indigent facility, another therapist. And then I met his son. Uh, it took a couple of years. We we're broke as a joke. Uh, we had uh, the clients, we had a lot of clients that we got because a lot, a lot of people knew me in the, in, in the, the addiction field. They knew him in the addiction field also. And, you know, we were struggling. Sometimes we couldn't make payroll, but we went to meetings. I had a sponsor. I, I, I talked about what was going on with me. I was exercising and doing all that stuff. And so what eventually happened was I got into being uh, from that $300 investment there's a whole story behind that. I won't go into the whole story. Uh, in 2012, we sold it for $45 million. We had seven buildings and 147 employees. And uh, that's what I talk about when I lecture to help motivate people. And that's why I wrote the book, The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up. And I want to read a little passage for your 
Yeah, go ahead. No matter what go ahead. The kid from the South Bronx who never gave up. Here is my roadmap for positive change. There is one thing in this world, one special lesson, one constant that has guided me through the turbulent waters of life. This infinite rule, which most people know but ignore, or who simply do not follow their life lessons. That is, no matter what, no matter the circumstances, the obstacles, the people that get in our way, or things that slow us down, follow this one simple rule. Never give up on your dreams, never let go of your passions, and especially never give up on yourself or a God of your understanding. My name is John Giordano, and I am a recovering addict who turned $300 into $45 million. I was blessed to become extremely successful, and I'd like to share my story with you. This is how my life was transformed and how I was saved from falling into the abyss of hell and by following this one rule and learning how to have a life worth living. So that's what I wrote the book for, to give people hope. Doesn't matter what kind of family you came from, what kind of education you started with, uh, what you did, what you didn't do, you can be successful. In many different arenas, not just with money, but with your life. And the best high in the world is helping God's kids. Yeah. And that's what I do. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. And what do you do in the here and now, John, after all these years of recovery? What do you do in the here and now to kind of keep yourself on the straight and narrow? I, I still do therapy with people. People don't have any money. I don't charge them. Uh, or charge them a little bit. Okay, because um, we used to have a saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Okay, so uh, people have to pay for treatment, whatever they can pay, all right? But if they don't pay anything, they don't appreciate it. Yeah. It's, you know, so uh, I have my podcast, uh, How to Beat Your Addictions. Then I have another podcast I do is uh, The Pros and Cons of Psychedelic Treatment. So that's my other one. Uh, I uh, was part owner of a ketamine clinic. Um, uh, I lecture at, uh, psychedelic conferences. I lecture at international conferences still about what we went over today. Um, uh, I'm opening up an aftercare program now for people to get out of treatment so they can have long-term care and teaching them and educating them and doing group therapy. Okay. With them. Uh, so they have long-term care, not just short-term success. So that's what I do. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. And one last question as we come towards the end. What do you feel like over your life was the best investment you made in terms of time or money? What was one of the best investments you feel like you've made? The best investment was my recovery. Can't get any better than that, man. You know, because I was going down a real dark road, like most of us. And just don't give up. You know, even though things seem dark, even though you don't realize you may be getting better, just keep going, you know? And, and, don't, and don't pigeonhole yourself, you know? Look at things where you want to grow and just go for it. Remember, there are no failures in life. There are only lessons. Those are our lessons. They're not our failures. A failure is when you quit and you give up. Yeah, really important advice. And even for me, you know, investing in my recovery and my mental health has been the most valuable investment and, yeah, given me an amazing ROI on my whole life, right? And the same is for you. Right. Well, there you go. Yeah. And now you're doing God's work, whatever yeah. God is for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, thank you very much for coming on the podcast, John. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Where are you from, by the way? I'm from the UK, I'm just outside oh, okay. London. Where are you now? In the UK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the UK. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, you guys got a, 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 a. I I was there. There's a you got a big problem with drugs there, just like we do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and especially in London, in the city, you know, definitely loads of people drinking, doing cocaine. Um, I think the UK is one of the biggest 
um, consumers of cocaine in the world, um, we're definitely um, is a problem. And that's why I work with clients every single day, helping them well, get you know, their drink the and drug use under control. Fentanyl. They're putting fentanyl in everything, in coke. They're putting on pot. They're putting it everywhere in the United States. Yeah. And they're making these fake pills and fake Xanax when that's ketamine. People are, I mean, not ketamine, um, uh, fentanyl. People are dying like flies. I don't know if they're doing that in the UK, but they're doing that in the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely becoming a big problem. Yeah, 100%, yeah. 100%. Um, but yeah, no, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me.